welcome to all of our listeners and hello, Melissa. Hello, Teresa. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. How about you? I just had a nice week long break from everything. So it was kind of nice, completely unplugged from technology. So it was good. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Uh, I did not. (laughs) Mine's coming. (laughs) Mine's coming next week. So I am glad you had a good vacation. That's really important to get relaxed. And um, it's also, you know, we don't often think about it, but when we're tense and working all the time and scrunched over our computers and scrunching our necks up and, you know, doing all the things we humans do, it causes most of us a lot of pain. And so I had started thinking about this last week because it's definitely time for a vacation, although that's not ideal. We need to learn to do it at our desks, not wait till we have a vacation. Not push, push, push till we're so exhausted that now we can't do anything but take a break. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, But one of my uh, friends um, has a neck problem. And if she doesn't really rest when it flares up, then she's in chronic pain. And then it's really Mm -hmm. hard for her to get it out, like to loosen it up. And so that got me thinking about chronic pain. So of course I did a little research and it turns out about 50 million Americans have chronic pain, which is where it hurts all the time for three months or longer. That's a lot of pain. (laughs) So that got my interest. And that's according to the CDC. But then there's also like what I would think of as chronic pain is anything that lasts more than, you know, a day, but from injuries, maybe from an illness, you know, that maybe they go away in three weeks, but that is still an incredibly long time mm-hmm. to be miserable. Pain, yeah. Pain is <laughs> yeah. awful. <laughs> and um, the most common types are lower back, migraine, headache, neck, and facial, which I thought was interesting. Facial oh, pain. Interesting. Yeah, facial pain. Um, other than me gritting my teeth, you know, like sometimes I'll get like chronic pain for a while in my jaw, but it said facial. So I'm not sure what that is. Hmm. Um, but anyway, so I thought maybe we could talk about the relationship between mindfulness and pain. We're really talking about chronic pain, but I, to me, it's really any kind of pain. I don't like to be in pain for five minutes, much less days, weeks, or months. So No, me either. Interesting that you bring it up, the pain thing. And I was just talking about vacation because the very first day of our vacation, my lower back went out and I was not able to enjoy our vacation to its fullest extent because of that. Every single day I was in excruciating pain. Oh gosh. I'm yeah. So, yeah. It stinks. That's <laughs> awful. Stuff. I've been in pain for the past three weeks now, um, jammed my thumb. So every time I go to do something, it pops out of place and I get a shooting pain, but it's not, it doesn't hurt all the time now. It was hurting all the time. So before we start this, of course, I do have a little disclaimer here. Um, Melissa and I may be considered experts in mindfulness, but we are not medical experts. <laughs> so no, no, this, is, no. <laughs> this is in no way to suggest that you stop doing something that your doctor is telling you to do or that you stop taking any kind of medication. The key with mindfulness and mindfulness meditation is, first of all, to start out with looking at it as a supplement to whatever you're doing. And beyond that, you know, it's up to you, but you need to talk to your doctor and make sure you're not harming yourself. There are a lot of studies about how much mindfulness can help us with pain management. So I hope you find some of this information valuable. The other weird thing is, and, and I, I just never think of this, but we don't really know what pain is. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of nerves and neurotransmitters and like, all, you know, all kinds of things going on that it's like a mystery. So doctors know, okay, they poke you, that hurts. And they prescribe a medication or they, you know, whatever they do, depending on what the pain is. But as far as the mechanics of it, the only thing we know for sure is inflammation causes a ton of our pain, but it causes it. We still don't understand exactly how pain works. We just know that what it is emotionally or uh, even mentally is it's our body's alert system. So when something is wrong, we get the corresponding hormones or neurotransmitters or whatever it is, shoot to the brain to say, ouch, it hurts. Stop yeah. it. And it's really to stop us from doing something to further damage our body. So some, some people don't have that little voice in there <laughs> that says, <laughs> stop, don't do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that that's an interesting perspective because we resist pain, right? It's like, oh, no, 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 I don't. I, I just said it. I yeah. can't stand being in pain. But it's there for a reason. 
right? So each time my thumb is popping out of place, which is multiple times a day, it's my reminder, put the brace back on. You know, I have a brace to keep on it. It just makes it hard to type. So I keep taking it off and then I forget to put it back on. It's like our own personal alert system. Right? Yeah. So how does mindfulness help with this? Um, I, I don't know if you agree with this or not, Melissa. I mean, I think one of the main things, there's many we can talk about, but one of the main things is um, with relaxing the body because yes. when you're tense, the pain intensifies, right? I mean, if you think about a woman going into labor as she's going through the childbirthing process, what is, what is the big thing she's doing the whole time? Breathing. Breathing. Right? Because if you can keep your body relaxed, it's going to make the pain less intense. Mm -hmm. No, I do agree with that. And I didn't really realize that until I started yoga and yoga. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about like acrobatic, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about just like the practice of yoga, of the breathing and the going internal, very similar to mindfulness. And it really does put you in tune with your body. And this is kind of why I feel like I almost appreciate pain. I know that might sound a little strange, but like you were just saying, it is our warning system. It's our signal. And when you practice yoga, I mean, from the, from the hair follicles on your head, all the way down to your toenails, you are completely in tune with every sensation in your body. And had I not been so in tune with all of those things, I mean, I could have seriously hurt myself doing certain things or even during yoga, you know, I did injure my shoulder because I was not paying attention. I wasn't really like in tune, but once I got in tune, it was like, Oh, I know exactly what I need to change. I need to shift this. And then, then it would be fine. And I think that the more in tune we are with every little nuance that our body is, you know, telling us something is going on, then we're going to be in much better shape physically and mentally. I'm glad you brought up yoga because yoga really is, a, it's like a moving meditation, mm -hmm. a mindfulness practice. But when you're in chronic pain, it's so important. Or even if you're chronically ill, let me just, I'll just put a big blanket of this out there. It's so important that you start with self-compassion right? There's something ailing you. And you, you know, if it was somebody you knew, what would you do? You would have empathy for them and, you know, maybe baby them a little bit or take care of them. So we, that's where we start, right? With self-compassion. But the second thing is throw the quote shoulds out the window when it comes to mindfulness or meditation. If you have uh, restricted mobility of any kind, like in any part of your body, it may be very challenging for you to do something like a body scan. Right? Mm -hmm. Because as you focus on that area, you could actually start traumatizing yourself because it feels too intense, for example. Yeah. Or if your arms hurt, you know, you're, you're not going to do every yoga pose or any yoga pose, maybe like, you know what I mean? So just adapt it to you, what you can do, comfortably do. Um, emotionally, pain doesn't just affect our bodies. It affects our, our mental state, our emotions, every aspect of us as a system is impacted. So maybe that's not the time to try to do even a 10 minute meditation. If you're feeling, oh, you can get depressed, anxious, you know, all the whole gamut of emotions if you're in chronic pain. So maybe you dip a toe in, you only, you try meditating for 30 seconds. If it's really bad, step back out. You don't, there, there's, there's no one saying if you don't do it for the X amount of time or in an X position or whatever it is, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Not true. Sure. Dip the toe in, pull it out as soon as you feel like you can't do it anymore. Just, you know, play with it, but recognize that it's a tool for you to use to help you feel better. And so if you're doing anything that starts to make you feel worse, that's not the route to go, right? You need to stop. And like you said, you don't want your shoulder hurt. The minute you feel something that doesn't feel better or at least okay, then just stop. There's no right or wrong. The idea is to use it to its fullest advantage. Yeah. And meditation also does help in that sense that it help, it allows you to, to somewhat come outside of the pain, if that makes sense and look at it from the outside in. Um, and I know that that sounds really difficult and it is difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. You know, my husband went through the same kind of thing that you went through with the, um, poly myalgia, myalgia rheumatica. rheumatica. Yes. <laughs> polymyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica. And, uh, it was very difficult, I think, for him, and I don't know if this was true for you, to, when you're in pain, like you said, it's not just your body, your mind is so involved in it. And his motivation to try to make himself feel better 
it just wasn't there. You know, he was just feeling down and down and depressed about it. And finally he, he pulled himself out of it, you know, by small meditations. It wasn't even like this long drawn out 10 minute meditation, which that's not even really that long for some of us. It feels really long. And I mean, all he would do in the mornings was sit on the floor and just breathe and slowly, but surely he was able to pinpoint exactly, you know, what was causing the pain, where it was starting, when it was starting. And by kind of focusing in and honing in and coming from the outside in and looking at it that way, instead of being so, I guess, suffocated by it, if that makes sense, or feeling like you're drowning in the pain, it does kind of allow you to step outside of it and look at it from that perspective of, okay, how am I going to manage this pain? That's an excellent perspective. Um, and it's really interesting. This is one of the areas too, that kind of shows us once we get the hang of it. So you're right. This, you're not going to instantly be in touch with your entire body, right? So you're going to have to work your way up to, to understanding it, but you can definitely breathe unless you've got a, a breathing problem. But I mean, that's the place to start if you're having mobility problems or movement problems. Um, but when you focus on an area, so I tried this years ago cause I didn't, I didn't understand it. So I just tried it, but it was uh, for, I had, uh, twisted my knee hurt like a son of a gun. Right? And so every step was like just excruciating. And so th there's a, a mindfulness practice where you basically, you know, you breathe, you get calm, and then you focus with as much intensity as you can on just the area that hurts. So as you focus on it, you start, to, you actually can start to, I don't know if you're feeling it or visualizing, I don't know a good way to explain it, but you start to realize it's not just one thing. It's not like a knife stabbing you in the knee. It's, oh, there's like a layer of tingling and there's a layer of kind of a sharp, consistent pain and there's a little bit of throbbing and you start to realize, again, because pain is a mystery how it works, it's not just this one, like a quick hit. It's, oh, there's all these levels. Well, as you're, as you're doing that, you're not only getting in touch with your body, but you're turning on different parts of the brain. For any of you that are in pain, you know, I'm sure you know what I mean. When, you, when something hurts, especially really badly, it's hard to think of anything else. It's like, <laughs> it's exhausting. It's exhausting, I think, because you know you need to try to focus on your job or on whatever else is mm -hmm. going on. But it's, it's, it's all consuming sometimes. Like you were saying, it's just, it can be overwhelming. So when you break it down into, if you have pain just in one area, start to play with that come up with every description you can of what you're experiencing and you start to see well actually the tinkling part's really not that bad it's irritating but it's not really painful oh and this part actually isn't painful it's a little bit uncomfortable you can get down to what's the one thing that is really hurting because we lump it all together as if it's just one phenomenon pain and and it's not it's multiple things well and we try to and and there's no sh no blame in this because i do the same thing but we also try to avoid it right so we try yes. to oh okay i know i have this horrible headache just try not to think about it just move on move forward what if we stopped and actually focused on it what would happen and it's funny before i even found mindfulness i used to do this when i would have any kind of a pain or i would injure myself it was like okay focus on where it hurts like close your eyes and just focus on that one spot and the longer i focused on it the more it would dissipate. Yeah. And I don't know if it was just because of the focus. Like I wasn't thinking about all of the other areas of my body that were then tense because now somewhere hurt your entire body tenses up, yeah. which is exhausting. And then mentally it's exhausting. But if you just stop and just focus on the one spot, if it's one spot, I mean, you could have massive body pain, but um, it really did help me. And I don't, I, it must be because of that. I don't know. There've been a lot of studies on this, that it can, it can reduce pain. Um, and it's used a lot, like at, um, I think it's the University of Wisconsin and Mass General, maybe Washington, wherever John Cabot Zinn is. Is that Washington? I can't remember where it is. Mm. Um, but they've done studies for years now and work with the uh, cancer departments to help people manage their pain from cancer and, and mm. especially chronic pain over a long period of time. So it's absolutely effective. So I don't think there's a problem there. The problem is figuring out what you can do yeah. and, and not cause yourself emotional distress or physical distress. So for me, when I got the PMR, um, I, I couldn't move my arms above my waist. The, the pain was unbearable in my shoulders and I couldn't sit or lie down for more than about an hour or my hips were just screaming. Like it was just horrible pain. So I'm and just gonna say for people that don't know what that 
condition is it's basically it's like massive inflammation in your body and it causes extreme joint pain um can lead to a lot of different ailments and it really is crippling so sorry go ahead no thank you for that i was so freaked out so <laughs> what happened is i i had a little bit of pain for a couple of weeks i'm like why oh, i'm so so stiff or whatever but nothing nothing that was screaming i was in trouble and then i went to bed one night and when i got up the next morning I couldn't get out of bed because I couldn't lift my legs. I thought I was paralyzed. So it, it became this very, what happened to me? <laughs> and so again, that stress of, am I dying? Am I paralyzed? Why do I hurt so bad? This is horrible. It starts to kind of over consume, right? It's like, oh, really bad. And then the second thing that happened is I have an HMO. So I couldn't get right in like immediately to the doctor. I had to wait like several days and I couldn't dress myself. I mean, I really could not do anything. And so this leads into part of what you were talking about with the focus, but it's really the mindfulness practice of acceptance. And acceptance doesn't mean you like it. Acceptance means you you say, okay, instead of fighting it, like, I mean, I believe me, I wanted to fight it. I'm like, no, 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 total denial, I don't have this. But instead it was like, okay, I have this, whatever this is, I didn't know what it was yet. What am I gonna do? What, you know, what can I do? What could I do to alleviate some? So I just kind of kept working through it that way. But first is accepting it. Right? Because if you don't accept it, you're resisting it. And if you're resisting it, you're tense. And then the second big piece of this to me is medication. Before the opioid epidemic, instantly the first thing that happened when you went to the doctor if you were in pain is they gave you some kind of pain pill. And of course, for the past 10 years, a lot of those have been some kind of an opioid. And I'm not criticizing. I understand that it must work really well. I get that. Um, but of course, it, it took a long time for the information to come out of just how addictive it, it is and how many people have died over the past 10 years. And I mean, it's just horrific. And so now doctors are pulling back from that, right? They're not just willy nilly writing prescriptions. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Of course, if you like after surgery or something major, I'm not saying people should never take an opioid, but it was unmonitored for too long because I just don't think anybody was really getting how dangerous this was. But when I got the PMR and finally got into the doctor, the first thing they said is you have to go on corticosteroids. And I was like, my brain goes steroids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm just, I don't, I don't I've, I've never had a good connotation with that. Uh, so I did some research. It's the most common thing. They write you a prescription for corticosteroids. They, it starts at one dosage. They try to wean you down. As soon as pain comes back, they wean you back up. But me being me, I don't take anything. And so of course I got every side effect imaginable. Yeah, which is now I wasn't in pain. I, I, that's true. They alleviated the pain, but I had a whole new set of complications. And so the estimate was I would have to stay on the corticosteroids two to three years. And about six months in, my skin was starting to thins your skin to like tissue paper. I mean, there were all other kinds of side effects. The point being, I needed an alternative. And so I weaned myself very slowly, told the rheumatologist what I was doing, said, I'm not taking these anymore. Weaned myself off over the course of about a month, switched for a while to ibuprofen, combined with mindfulness and meditation. And so it doesn't mean I, I never hurt, but it was nothing like the intensity I had when the, the flare up first happened. And there's no side effect to mindfulness or to meditation. So there's good side effects. There's well, good that's true. Yes. That's good point. Yes. There's no <laughs> negative side effects yeah. uh, for the vast majority of people. And we've mentioned this before, but there are about 10 to 12% of the population that don't do well with meditation. Right. Yeah. I don't know anyone who doesn't do well with mindfulness, right? Because <laughs> it's just, you're just exercising your mind. But the, the, I had to do very simple things because remember, I couldn't move. I couldn't get dressed at first, but it was just breathing, paying attention to my breathing very slow movement, like, you know, start stretching my body back out, uh, very, very short, careful walks. But it was just a slow process, which took self-compassion and it took patience, which is pretty good. But I was pretty impatient and I was frustrated because I wanted to, you know, get things done. And I could not do things like an entire body scan, right? Mm -hmm. There was just too many parts that hurt and it just felt like, oh, I'm just making myself feel worse. I got back to it within probably two months. Um, never went back to the corticosteroids. The, the PMR slowly resolved itself. I think it took about a year and the PMR was a million times better. And now if I even start to feel the slightest ache in a shoulder or in my hip, it's like I immediately calm down, relax, 
you know, what do you need to do? Are you getting enough sleep? Another area, so speaking of inflammation, because, I mean, if you think of all the people with arthritis or with um, things like PMR or um, fibromyalgia, they're both kind of vague. It's kind yeah. of like a pot that it's where they know there's inflammation, but again, it's like a catch all for yeah. the symptoms. Yeah. Don't know what caused it. Don't really know how the pain is working, but we know we can stop the pain with a pill. Well, you can also greatly lessen the pain without medication if you have side effects. And again, if you're taking medication, don't stop it. Don't stop. Do We're not saying it. that. <laughs> Another thing, and this, this I did religiously when I started doing my research back then, is food. There mm -hmm. are so many foods that cause inflammation, right? And I know you can speak to this, Melissa, because you are such a healthy eater, but it's like change your diet. Yeah. That's a mindful act to think about what you're putting in your body. Is it anti-inflammatory or is it inflammatory? We think a lot about our bones when we talk about inflammation and we think about our joints and things like that, but you have to think about your gut as well, because your gut can get inflamed. The lining of your gut can get inflamed. And that's also a huge factor in so many diseases. And, and when I say disease, I don't necessarily mean uh, a disease with a name, <laughs> but when our body is not at ease, it is at dis-ease, which is disease. And that's yeah. basically when we are not well. The list of foods that cause inflammation, that can cause inflammation. And I don't mean there, there's even a longer list that can, because each of us has a different system, but these are common foods that cause inflammation in the body. Sugar, uh, anything white, basically white flour, white sugar, white crackers, white bread, white pasta, like all of the mm -hmm. whites um, cause inflammation, uh, red meat and processed meat. So it's not just, you know, uh, hamburgers and steaks, it's uh, sausages, hot dogs, bacon, lunch, lunch meat, meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all of those, inflammation, alcohol, and then processed foods, because look how we eat in this country with the processed foods. So, Everything's processed, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think in terms of, oh, processed food is like if it comes in a box, but chips are processed food. Mm -hmm. Cookies, unless you make them at home, are processed food. Oleo, margarine, any, you know, butter substitute is any, in fact, probably most substitutes of anything are a processed food. Flavored yogurt is a processed food. Yeah. If it's got a flavor, they've done something to it. Um, and microwavable meals. Yeah. So, oh, don't get me started on that. Yeah. So basically, if you are suffering from pain, this is really worth looking into is mindful eating. You, you know, you think about, okay, what am I putting into my body and what is it doing? I can't, I think I was already taking turmeric every day as a mm -hmm. supplement before I got the PMR because turmeric is anti-inflammatory. So you can kind of look at even maybe natural substances or different uh, supplements to see, is there something that's anti-inflammatory? that you think you need, or you know, talk to your doctor about it, that would help lower that inflammation level. And that's, that's just mindful eating. Yeah. And I will say like some of my recommendations personally, and again, I'm not a dietitian, but skip the substitutes. I'm not saying have these things in excess, but if it, if you can't pronounce the things on the label, you probably shouldn't be eating it. And if you're going to have sugar, just have the real stuff. Okay. No high fructose corn syrup. That is a major, major inflammatory food. Diet foods, anything that's diet, stay away from it. They may not make you inflamed, but they do a number on your nervous system. Okay. So anything with sucralose, all, even stevia, now they're starting to find stevia is not good for you. So go back to basics is kind of what I'm saying. Like go back to the stuff that we used to eat when we were young, maybe not in the quantities of red meat and potatoes that we used to eat, but you know, do things like that where you're, if it's convenient, if you're eating things out of convenience because it's prepackaged, it's all of those things. I get it. Okay. We're all short on time, but they're not really helping you health wise. And they could be greatly contributing to pain. And not only that, but drinks. Okay. This is a big issue in my household. Okay. My kids don't like to just drink water. And I try to find things that don't have fake sweetener in it because I, I don't let them drink soda. They can have it once in a while, but I really am anti-soda. And I'll try to get things that have either real sugar or they have stevia extract or monk fruit extract. Those aren't wonderful, but they're better than like a sucralose or an aspartame or things like that. 
but then you run into the problem of, oh my gosh, now I'm using all these plastic bottles. And it just, there's, there's so many things that just drive me nuts about our food system. But again, just go back to the basics, the healthier things. If it, if it comes in a box, if it comes pre-made in a bag, it's probably not very good for you. And I'm not saying completely eliminate it. That's, that's totally unrealistic, but yes, do, do it to make your life easier, but try really hard to just eat those things that we're here before processed food came along. Right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the, um, quote, sugar-free, uh, stuff that came out starting in the sixties, it was for two reasons. It was for dieting because everybody wanted to be skinny and it was for diabetics who weren't supposed to be eating sugar. And yeah. we now know that the fake sugars still spike your insulin. Like it's, you're not helping yourself. So the key is to really try to cut down on anything sweet if you've got a problem related to sweet foods so that you're you're not overloading your body with something that you find out 10 years from now oh we were wrong because stevia was like the wonder sweetener like yeah the healthy choice and natural and now i just saw the same thing the studies coming out saying oops so did right. we learn our lesson from the potato chips that had the um oh. what they call it Oli. Ole olefra i can't remember what it was called but that didn't go so well. No, no, it didn't. <laughs> so maybe let's learn from those mistakes. <laughs> for anyone younger, it was this great, great chip that we could all have that was not only healthy for us, but you know, it was it was really tasted delicious and yeah, and it may, basically you spent the majority of your time in a bathroom. So it, yeah, it, it was not good for the digestive system, as <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> a little problem, yeah. Um, so okay, so we've got mindful breathing, small mindful and meditations or mindful activities within the what your ability is another big one with mindfulness and meditation is the stories we tell ourselves what really leads to the depression and the anxiety from chronic pain is we're telling ourselves over and over again this is terrible i can't believe this happened to me this is awful i'll never be normal again you know we've got all these lovely stories we tell ourselves this is what happened with my husband i mean he is a six foot four, very fit guy and very strong. This happened to him and he was basically bedridden for a year. And what that did to his mental, you know, wellness was awful. He just was it, it, all the things that he kept saying, I'm never going to be able to surf again. I'm never going to be able to ride a bike. I'm never, because it's hard. We talked about this in the last episode. It's hard. You get suck down into that little spiral of negative negative thoughts and it's so hard to pull yourself out because it's hard to see that positive light at the end of the tunnel and when he finally did you know accept like you said that this is where i am right now that's the mindful part of it okay i'm not this isn't a year from now all i can do is think about right now the pain i'm having right now and not worry about what it's going to be in a couple of years now it's easy for me to say that I want to preface that it's easy for me to say that because I don't have chronic pain. So I'm sure it's extremely hard to try to only focus on the present, especially if you have something like cancer or, you know, something that could be life-threatening later down the line. I know that has to be very difficult. So I don't want to diminish anybody's feelings about that, but really trying to focus on right now is going to be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another facet of mindfulness, right? Staying mm -hmm. in the present moment. There's a lot of guided meditations out there, including on our YouTube channel. Start with a guided meditation that helps you, you, you examine your thoughts. Think of them like painful thoughts, just like the pain in your body. Now you're adding more pain. And mm -hmm. so you can look at it. Why am I thinking that? Where did it come from? Um, the thoughts don't stop, right? So we have a choice. Again, I agree with you. It's hard. Um, I remember just getting stuck in this. I had a wonderful quality of life and it's gone because yeah. I couldn't move, right? And that's a very depressing thought. And so it's you're examining your thoughts just like you examine a physical pain. Okay, oh, if I really look at it, it it passes. Another thought pops in, another thought pops in, and you kind of start to realize like it's a good reinforcement that we are not our thoughts, but we can certainly choose a better thought if it's going to help us feel better instead mm -hmm. of getting again sucked into that exactly what you're talking about the whole quagmire going downhill and then there are a lot of mindfulness groups a lot of them available in hospitals now john cabot zinn started that now there's a whole lot of them in different hospitals here at, in la ucla has a, an entire research department on mindfulness and uh, patients are referred over if they're dealing with um, any kind of emotional or physical stress to help them relax 
So it's, it's, I guess, I mean, like in a nutshell, it's, you know, okay, take, take care of your heart, self-compassion, like, oh, this stinks. I hate it. I don't want it. Okay. Be nice to yourself. Put your hand on your heart. <laughs> Say, okay, I don't like it, but it's happening and I'm going to get through it. And what can I do? Well, if you're calm, you also think more clearly. So you can come up with more creative solutions maybe to some of the challenges that you're facing. And again, mindfulness, small meditations at first, if you can't sit for a long time or you're just uncomfortable emotionally with it, mindful eating, mindful thoughts, uh, mindful actions in general uh, can greatly alleviate the suffering as you're going through the process and then you're setting up a great habit just in general for your life, but it can really help you get through managing that all-consuming pain so that it's not the dominant thing in your everyday activities. Yeah. And I think once you can get past the initial, probably most painful part of the chronic pain where you're past that, you know, that hump and you're kind of at the, you know, keeping things in a more steady pain, uh, I would really encourage you to explore tapping and mm -hmm. Tapping, especially for pain, is a lifesaver. So maybe try to find a practitioner near you. Uh, I just used tapping on my trip when I was on vacation. Did it completely remove my back pain? No, but it made each day easier to you know manage the pain. And then by like the fourth day, I was feeling better. So it's definitely something worth exploring if you're open to it and you're not, you know, if you can manage the actual tapping part. I, I really do encourage people to check that out. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. Um, I guess the final thing I would have to say on this is about medication. And that is if you are shifting your, not just medication, medication and treatments. A lot of medication has side effects. A lot of treatments are uncomfortable, right? So if you are practicing mindfulness and breathing to stay calm and grounded, it can enhance mm. whatever's happening with those treatments because you're not resisting it, right? So, you know, if you're going to sit with an IV in for, I have a friend right now going through this every other week or something where she's got to sit for about five hours going through um, a, a type of uh, experimental chemo. It's uncomfortable. So I don't mean just putting the needle in your arm, but just being stuck, being trapped, being in a hospital all day that often. So if you just practice breathing, you stay calm, then you end up feeling better, but I honestly believe it helps your body then process whatever the thing is better mm -hmm. because you don't have the stress going on in there that, that you know, mucks yeah. things up. I use it at the dentist every time I go. I used to be in excruciating pain every time I went to the dentist and for days afterwards. And now I do deep breathing the whole time they're in my mouth and I leave and I feel fine. Mm -hmm. It just makes an enormous difference to accept and relax and realize it's going to pass. Maybe not chronic pain, but it can lessen or the treatment is going to pass at some point. And um, then you can at least get through it knowing that you're kind of doing something nourishing instead of something depleting and draining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you. Me yes. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a rough patch, but I'm glad, glad we're mostly through it. So <laughs> your husband and I are both active. In <laughs> yep. <laughs> We really appreciate you joining us today. Check out our guided meditations on the YouTube channel. Please feel free to drop us a line, including about any uh, mindfulness activities or meditations that you have found helpful if you do have chronic pain. And um, just be kind to yourself. Absolutely. And uh, I hope that this episode helps you guys if you are having some chronic pain. So let us know if there's anything else you need and we're happy to be here for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to other great shows. Visit our website, amindfulmoment.com, to access podcasts, scripts, and reading recommendations. A Mindful Moment is hosted by Teresa McKee and Melissa Sims. This podcast is produced by Work to Live Productions. Thank you for tuning in.